Good morning and welcome back to the channel. I hope that everybody is doing well today. If you are new here, then hi, my name is Brittany and I'm a nurse practitioner. Much of what I do here on this channel is educational content for either the nurse practitioner student or a licensed nurse practitioner. So for today's video, I'm gonna be talking all about hyponatremia or low sodium. And this is an excerpt taken from one of my complete lectures on my Patreon, where I talk about both high and low sodium. So if you wanna check out that full lecture, then go ahead and follow the link in the description box below. Otherwise, we're just going to get into the content today. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe, to the channel it really helps me out and i appreciate the support so let's just get into the lecture though hyponatremia let's talk about hyponatremia first so again hyponatremia is a low sodium and what we said was normal was between that 135 and 145 so low sodium is defined as sodium less than 135 milli equivalents per liter and really this hyponatremia this problem is related to an increase in water that is essentially diluting the sodium. I tried to draw a little graphic there for you, but it's essentially diluting with this excess water your sodium, causing the sodium to appear low. Excess water intake and impaired water excretion are the leading causes of a low sodium. So excess water intake and then impaired water excretion being the leading causes. And so I think of that story, and I don't know if you guys know of this, tell me in the comments if you do, but of the woman who died of water intoxication while participating in a water drinking contest. It was held on the radio, a radio talk show where they were competing for a Nintendo Wii, and it was like, hold your pee for a Wii or something. And the idea was that they had to drink large, large, large quantities of water and not go to the bathroom. If they had to go to the bathroom, they were disqualified, and they kept increasing their amounts of water. And I don't remember what it was that she drank, but she drank a ton of water in a very small amount of time. And it's actually reported that a nurse had called up there warning them of the potential side effects you know anything in excess can be dangerous this woman unfortunately died shortly thereafter she went home crying with a headache and what appears to have happened with her is she had water intoxication and appears from what I've read is that she had a brain herniation from the rapid brain swelling that's associated with that excess amount of water intake. And it's really, it can be very, very detrimental. I think that that story highlights the concept that taking in these extreme amounts of water dilutes the electrolytes. That's exactly what happened with this woman. She was taking in extreme amounts of water and her body and her brain didn't have time to accommodate and acclimate to these changes. And so everything sort of swells and the sodium dilutes and before you know it, the homeostasis of her body is off and it just it doesn't fare well for these patients. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about the serious detrimental effects of hyponatremia, but I just wanted to share that story because we can see here that worst case scenario, you know, results in death of a person. And so let's talk about the difference between acute and chronic hyponatremia. So acute hyponatremia, this is low sodium that occurs over 48 hours, so very quickly, very acutely. And in this circumstance, patients are more at risk for complications related, related to their sodium levels. So the quicker that this happens, the more that they're going to be at risk for having these horrible, horrible side effects. So two scenarios where acute hyponatremia is at an increased risk. So one is patients that are post-surgical and receiving IV fluids. And this is because a normal physiological response to surgery is an increase in our antidiuretic hormone. And so if a person has an increase in that antidiuretic hormone and they receive fluids, then there's a problem that we could see that potentially can occur and that they'll hold on to those fluids and then they'll have that dilutional hyponatremia. So patients that are post-surgery that have an increase in their antidiuretic hormone, which is a normal physiological response, and receiving parenteral fluids are at an increased risk for acute hyponatremia. Also, another specific example with acute hyponatremia is self-induced water intoxication. So, for example, that story that we just talk about, talked about with the water drinking contest. Also, other people that are at risk for this, though, would be competitive runners. There has been an increase in these type of events, of events with competitive runners and also persons that use the illicit 
drug ecstasy because occasionally they can experience extreme polydipsia and also experience that water intoxica intoxication again. And so it's helpful to know the definitions of hyponatremia and how it's classified as mild, moderate, and severe. And so the guidelines here, I got these from up to date, and it says, you know, mild hyponatremia, this is levels between 130 and 134. Moderate hyponatremia is 120 to 129. And then finally, severe is less than 120 milli equivalents per liter. That would be classified as severe hyponatremia. And then also the symptoms that are associated with hyponatremia are classified as well as either severe symptoms or mild moderate symptoms. And so severe symptoms related to hyponatremia can be very problematic. I mean, we talked about, you know, that it can result in, a, you know, eventually death, but we can see multiple different neurological events too. We can see seizures, coma, and then, like I said, brain herniation. So to reference back to when I made me mention that patients that have acute hyponatremia, they're at more risk for those severe complications. And this is seen directly with seizures and in relation to seizures. Seizures are a very common severe symptom associated with acute hyponatremia. And, that, and so we can see that it's directly correlated. Um, however, in the presence of chronically low sodium levels, neurological findings are uncommon. And this is because the brain is given more time to acclimate or accommodate to those changes in sodium. So mild to moderate symptoms that are related to hyponatremia, they're very non-specific. And so this is why, I mean, this is one reason why I should say a metabolic panel is so often used or utilized in practice because there's such a very broad sense of presentation with patients that have, you know, variations in electrolytes, uh, for example, specifically talking about electrolytes. And so with that mild to moderate hyponatremia, we really do, we see very vague, nonspecific symptoms. And so symptoms include fatigue, body aches, headaches, nausea, vomiting, dizziness, memory problems, balance issues, and so you can see, I mean, really, it's a wide variety of symptoms that a patient can experience and why you, you need to actually see the lab values to be able to try and determine a correlation between the symptoms that they're having and then th the labs. So a good question to always ask is, you know, what patients need to be um, transferred to a high lev higher level of care and need to be managed in the hospital? And so any patient with an acute onset of hyponatremia should be um, hospitalized and they should be managed closely. They monitor their, monitor their electrolytes very closely. Anyone that has severe levels, so that's that less than 120, and then anyone that has symptoms related to their hyponatremia also need to be managed in the hospital. And so you can see it could be hard to determine, you know, with these nonspecific symptoms, if it is related to their hyponatremia. And so a really good rule of thumb that I read is that if their sodium is below 130, then it's really likely that it's causing symptoms. And so if they're having any of those vague nonspecific symptoms and their sodium is less than 130, it's very likely that they are correlated. And anyone, again, that has symptoms related to their hyponatremia needs to be hospitalized because they have increased risk and potential for worsening symptoms. And we just went over, you know, how detrimental they can be. And so you really want to err on the side of caution. And so in addition, any patient that has a recent brain injury, and so this includes brain surgery, any anyone that has some form of brain lesion, they're also at an increased risk um, related to hyponatremia. And because they're at an increased risk at baseline, they need to be managed inpatient as well. Otherwise, generally, uh, the remaining population doesn't require inpatient treatment. So again, just to clarify though, if it's severe levels, if it's acute, and if they have any symptoms, hospital. And then always, again, you wanna use your clinical reasoning. And so how do we treat these patients with hyponatremia? And so for starters, all patients that have a sodium less than 135, we have a mainstay of treatment for these patients. So sodium less than 135, we want to have them avoid worsening their hyponatremia. And so one, we want to address any medications that might be contributing to their low sodium. And unless there are no alternatives, 
and stopping that medication would cause them direct harm, then these medications should be stopped to prevent, again, that worsening hyponatremia. So examples of medications that can contribute to hyponatremia would be ACE inhibitors, ARBs, so those angiotensin receptor blockers, thiazide diuretics. Also, there's certain antipsychotics and anticonvulsants that can also contribute to this. And that's why you always want to make sure you have an updated medication list. And if they are presenting, you know, with these abnormal lab values, all right, then we start looking at meds and what could be contributing to this and what can we take off. Um, in addition to medication adjustments, these patients should decrease their electrolyte free water intake. Because again, remember, it's often related to dilutional hyponatremia. So we want to decrease that electrolyte free water intake and or so we can combine the two, increase their dietary salt intake. And generally, the studies have shown that these measures alone are really all that's needed for patients that are asymptomatic with chronic mild to moderate hyponatremia. Because again, remember, acute, severe, those patients are in the hospital. For patients that are hospitalized and they're being treated for their hyponatremia in the hospital, generally it's a hypertonic saline solution that they use, typically 3% saline, and their electrolytes are frequently reassessed. All right, well, I hope you guys enjoyed that lecture. Again, don't forget, if you want to check out the full lecture where I also talk about hypernatremia, then follow that link in the description box below, and that will take you to my Patreon. This lecture is available on both the $5 and the $40 tier. But otherwise, I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. Don't forget to learn something new every day, and I will talk to you guys very soon. Bye.